Welcome back to another Caring Support Podcast. Really excited this week to have a true superstar doing her huge, beautiful, inspirational moments and even writing a book. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Helen Ofusu. Is that correct? Ofusu, correct. Ofusu. And Helen, thank you for being here today. Um, could you please introduce yourself for our audience? Absolutely. Well, thank you for inviting me to your podcast. Uh, by profession, I'm a work and business psychologist. And I've been using that um, since the early 2000s, but most specifically since 2012 in my own company, uh, offering executive coaching, career coaching, and some HR services. So really happy to be here. That's awesome. Um, Good on you. And uh, obviously, there's so much wonderful stuff to talk about. I think what, what we like more than anything is you're a very inspiring person for a lot of people. Uh, plus all the wisdom that you have to share. So let's get started. Kelly's going to ask all the questions, please. Helen, it's very nice to have you here with us today. We, Our first question for you is, why did you decide to go into a career as a psychologist, coach, and consultant? Well, I didn't start my career as a consultant and coach. I started my career as a, basically as a personnel psychologist within the federal public service. So in that role, I learned a lot about succession planning. I learned a lot about career development and even evaluating people for for job opportunities and for uh, access to developmental opportunities. You know, because in all of those circumstances, they don't just, you know, let people apply. They apply and they basically are competing. So that's where I kind of cut my teeth. And the government was great for a lot of things, but I felt that I needed to try something a little different. I felt more like an entrepreneur at my in my core and certainly had a creative streak. So I've been basically using this uh, creativity to help solve challenging work-related problems for individuals and for organizations in my own company since, 90, since uh, 2012. It's a bit of a long-winded story, but... That's where it is. No, that's great. I think a lot of the stuff in the government must have probably given you an opportunity to see things from another spectrum, to to obviously gain some experience there. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing you know how you're helping people with with the you know building resiliency, et cetera, in their careers. Mm-hmm. And um, this is so critical, and especially in a candidate led market, it's important for people to really understand what that means. Well, that's it. And you make a, an interesting point because really the book and my my orientation is about building resilient careers or yeah. building resilient organizations, not building personal resilience. Because I do think that many of us have an awful lot of balls in the air and dealing with a lot of challenges. So I don't think it's fair to expect superhuman resilience out of people. And that's why I like to help them do things and understand things so that their careers can basically take care of them for the long term. Very interesting. Absolutely. What inspired you to write your book, How to Be Resilient in Your Career, Facing Up to Barriers at Work? Well, probably two things. The first thing is that had this book existed, 15 or 20 years ago, I would be a superstar right now if I'd read it. So it's really the book that I wish I I could have found years ago. And the second thing is that in my executive coaching and career coaching practice, you know, almost 11 years, the same things keep coming up for people. And these are high functioning, good earning, high performing people. So if these are themes that come up, whether they use these words or not, then regular folks who have more normal career trajectories and more normal academic backgrounds and all the rest, they are really going to find value in this book. So those are the two big reasons. So basically the book, it's structured as um, each chapter covering uh, a common career challenge that's been coming up again and again and again. So things like underemployment, things like dealing with harassment, bullying, um, toxic workplaces, 
being an only or kind of an underrepresented person in a workplace, those those kinds of themes. Interesting. And by the way, Helen, you are a superstar. Oh, okay. thank you. <laughs> Even if only here, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a superstar in my book. So there you have it. Go ahead, Kelly. So in thinking about that, there's a lot of uh, what James said earlier with it being a candidate driven market and lots of interviews going on and people going to many, many interviews and kind of having the the pick of the litter, so to speak, when it comes to jobs right now. What red flags should people be watching for during interview processes? Well, there's a whole chapter on toxic workplaces and part of that chapter is identifying problematic workplaces up front so that hopefully you don't end up in them and having your livelihood kind of intertwined with really unpleasant and unsavory things. So, you know, there are a few red flags for sure. During the interview process, if you're going for an interview and the person who's interviewing you doesn't even seem to know who you are, doesn't seem to have looked over your resume, your cover letter, seems distracted, or even the person who you're supposed to be reporting to doesn't participate, all of these things are red flags. Other times you may seem to be going through step after step after step, and the process seems never ending. And you kind of wonder, well, what are they looking for? Do they even know what they're looking for? That's another, you know, problematic uh, red flag, unless it's an organization that has very specific uh, circumstances. So, for instance, if you're working in a top secret environment, there you can expect the regular interview process plus a bigger, deeper dive in terms of your background and your suitability, you know, in terms of you being somebody who's uh, likely to be able to keep those secrets, those uh, trade secrets, those national, uh, you know, those national kinds of secrets. But outside of that, it shouldn't take forever. Mm. And another piece is that quite often if you're looking for a job, especially in an established organization, somewhere along the lines, you're gonna hear why they're hiring. Maybe they're growing, Maybe somebody's moving into another role, but there's usually some kind of reason and it's it's something that they can be proud of. But when they're very cagey about why they're hiring and there's no real straightforward answer or you keep hearing that they're forever hiring but not growing, all of these things should make you think twice. Interesting. That's a. These are very good points. Um, I know within caring support, when we're helping unpack and understand recruitment processes and stuff, you know, what I tell a lot of health care organizations, for instance, is saying, hey, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but it's no longer about you. And it's about the candidate. It should have always been about the candidate. But the thing is, is do you really understand who they are and what they want and how to appeal to them? And, and instead of, oh, we're awesome, we're this, we're that, it's, you know, now you really need to convince that nurse that, you know, PSW that, whoever it is, to come to my organization, why? Why would I, why do I have to go to you as opposed to someone else? Mm -hmm. So I like what you're saying because many times when, when, when we've been talking to people and candidates, it's really important that, that them to understand, you know, you're empowered now and you have to really think about what do you want and does this organization really think about you? put you first to make you feel part of something special? Are you respected, heard, about, like valued? So I, I love what you're saying, Helen, because, you know, these are, I think a lot of things, people just come in and they and they expect, you know, the employers like, well, I expect you to have done research and know our company and know our values and everything. But I know if people have come back and I said, well, didn't the person even read your resume? Well, I didn't think they got that. You know what I mean? And I'm going, man, I don't know. I would be really wondering, is that place somewhere you really want to work if that's their attitude towards, uh, you know, looking at new candidates? It's a very good point. All the especially, points you made. Especially in healthcare. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason people do those jobs, not robots, not software. Exactly. So the humanity of the people who are working there needs to be recognized. It's not an afterthought. 
Or at least it yeah. shouldn't be. Exactly. So there's the red flags that you watch for when you're going through the interview process, but sometimes people can't even really get to that part. They start experiencing something called imposter syndrome. This is something that I know that I've suffered um, from when it, when, you know, when you're doing a job search or even when you're in an interview and sometimes even when you know I'm at work, it can just it can just hit and you're it's so overwhelming. Can you give us maybe um, an overview of what imposter syndrome is, um, how it can affect these things like the job ser search process, interviews, even the employees day to day? And then if you have any tips for kind of combating that. Great, great question. And you may need to remind me of all the parts, but <laughs> briefly, the, uh, the imposter syndrome is when you have doubts about whether or not you belong somewhere or you're up to the, the task, despite the fact that you've done all the right things, you have objectively the right skills, the right experience. Even famous and successful people like Maya Angelou and Michelle Obama have said that they've dealt with the imposter syndrome. So it's something that affects a lot of capable, high-performing people. The difference between the folks who I've just mentioned and some of the regular folks is that these famous people, they didn't let it prevent them from taking their shot. So that's the big takeaway is that it's something that a lot of people deal with. So if you know you can do something, set aside that self-doubt, set aside that imposter syndrome and still go for broke. Take that big swing and take your shot. But I think there's two different versions of imposter syndrome or at least in my mind, and in terms of what I'm seeing. So there's folks who feel it because of their own, you know, their own self-doubt. And that's the traditional version. But the more I talk to members of underrepresented groups, the more I realize that perhaps their version of imposter syndrome is not because of their own feelings, but rather because they're treated like imposters. They're treated like they don't belong. They're treated as if their accomplishments and their skills are not really as great as they think they are. And then they start to internalize some of that. So I haven't found much research to kind of validate my uh, my perception. So if ever there is some researcher out there, this would be a great topic to figure out are there two versions, A and B? Because from what I'm seeing, there kind of are. It's a... Uh... Very interesting. I, uh, you know, I think we've all at some point in time fought, you know, imposter syndrome, at least the first part, mm -hmm. the self-doubt. Um, but, you know, I think what feeds into the first is the second one. Um, because, you know, when you're not accepted or whatever, which is usually an environment predicated by fear, meaning mm -hmm. that people in there are worried that this person is going to take over or whatever it is, or they're going to up, up, like show them up or anything and you know talking with some nurses and seeing mm -hmm. some content on linkedin they were like oh you know I, I come into an environment i've done four years to be an rn this uh, you know and they come in and, and they're treated like crap by some of the other nurses because of whatever and i'm going folks do, do we not think healthcare is broken enough that with this this crap doesn't help like we have to work together and we have to be willing to build each other up and encourage each other and and I personally believe, and I think a lot of people on our team, and certainly people I know, Helen, is anything's achievable, it's how badly do you want it, right? Yeah, but you raised some good points. I definitely see a lot of what you're talking about, where people yeah. are capable and they're hardworking and they start a new job. And fundamentally, most of us appreciate that in those early days, you better do a good job. Right? When you're on probation, you have to do yeah. a good job. And many people just want to do a good job, period, because they're conscientious, they're well-intentioned, and there's a lot at stake in healthcare. And so yeah. when people show up and they are doing great work because they're self-motivated, they're conscientious, it's unfair when other people feel threatened by that and then start to mistreat them or diminish what they're contributing but I see it. Yeah, you're right. 
hundred percent. You recently wrote an article that's on your blog on your website about micro kindness. And I think it was from possibly like an image that you had seen on LinkedIn or social media somewhere. So mm. can you explain what micro kindness is and how you believe that that can help to improve workplaces? Well, yeah, it's a, it's a concept that came to me when I was reading a colleague's LinkedIn. She had, she had posted something. And her work has to do with um, equity, diversity and inclusion. And, you know, these big systemic changes, they need time to, to, to catch on and they need time to rewrite policies and procedures and all the rest of it. And so for her, she was wondering, uh, was she falling short because some of these big processes can't happen quickly enough? And it made me realize, well, wait a second, while we wait for all these big things, aren't there little things that each of us can do to make a workplace better? So little things like, you know, the, the kinds of things we were taught when we were little kids or in school or by our parents, expressing gratitude, saying thank you when people do nice things or do things that are helpful, being courteous, saying please, trying to have a good attitude about, you know, whatever it is, especially in healthcare where, Often the stakes are are extreme and, you know, people are often rushed off their feet. Things like being cooperative and collegial. So if somebody's counting on you, you follow through and you do what you say you're going to do pretty much when you say you're going to do it. So these are all simple, basic things, but I just felt inspired to go ahead and write about micro kindness in a world where we hear all the time about microaggressions. And by no means am I saying that these micro kindnesses are going to make up for everything. But let's face it, in, in many workplaces, people know exactly how to behave, to be nice to one another. And they choose to do it for some people, but maybe not for other people. So if, they're, if we're all just more intentional about being, you know, kinder, even in small ways to everyone we interact with, even in the absence of some of these big systemic changes, every work environment is going to be a lot better for it. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it, I love the way you think, Helen. This is great. Um, and you have such a calm demeanor when you speak. <laughs> it's it's really awesome. It's it's very contagious um, in, a, in a really beautiful way. So what I love and, and to me, I look at this and I say, what are we really talking about? emotional intelligence and i'm a big huge advocate so i always tell people listen you need to really understand where people are coming from before you make this assessment or whatever and lead with help me understand you know stuff like that listen to understand rather than listen to reply mm -hmm. to really you know gather what's going on and there may be a reason people did certain things but this micro kindness is great because if we have integrity and we have emotional intelligence, we have all these things that are important, it would change everything because it would mean people would interact differently. They would be more aware of people around them, more mindful, more, you know, um, prepared to say, yeah, you know, I think really people mean the best. And maybe it's perhaps I didn't understand what they were doing. So, yeah, ask, right, rather than assume and judge and whatever else. And this happens too much. And yeah, I mean, I love it. I just wish they would teach this in school from a young age. I think they do teach it to little kids. Do they? <laughs> Probably. Yeah, I hope so, because it should <laughs> happen. It should happen all the time. And then there will be a lot less conflicts, a lot less problems in life, because pe that would be their go-to rather than going, oh, I take this personally, I'm offended, I'm, you know, there's no coping mechanisms. But this is the, the problem with so much of today. And then we look at it and say, well, geez, look at people flipping out over this, the, the something that you and I would think, you know, that's no big deal. But you're right. And especially, especially in the healthcare sector. Yeah. People are already nervous, right? If you're in hospital or if you need a PSW or you're going for any kind of testing or whatever, you're already a little bit activated. Yeah. We're already a little bit dysregulated, possibly. 
So these small things, the extra smile, the warmer tone of voice, whatever it is, it just helps keep things more on track. Yeah, I love it. Love it. What is the most important piece of advice or what would be one piece of advice or two that you would want to give anyone when it comes to facing their barriers at work? Number one, read the book. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, uh, I sometimes reflect on the cover that I almost used for this book because it does capture another key piece. So many of us have seen a photo where there is um, a cat looking in the mirror. And when they look in the mirror, it's like a lion or a tiger. So the, the point is that sometimes there's a difference between how we see ourselves and how others see us. And sometimes we need to focus on how we see ourselves and act accordingly. Because if we know we have value, know we can contribute, know we have worth, and we you know, reinforce those boundaries and just act accordingly, then odds are we're going to be steering ourselves away from bad things and, and, and towards things that suit us better. Yeah. So it's not that I use the cats as my backup uh, uh, book cover, but actually there was a, a, a chess piece, probably a pawn, that was looking in the mirror. And in the mirror, the, the, uh, the chess piece had a crown on, so they were the king or the queen. <laughs> but it looked a bit effeminate and really the book is meant for all, gem all, all genders so I stuck right. with the one that I went with but I think that's a big piece is not being totally swayed by what other people think and focusing on what we know is true about ourselves because if I had stopped or if I had focused too much on various stereotypes that people might attribute to me without knowing me I'm not sure where I'd where I'd be. Yeah, yeah, I like that a lot, Helen. Um, it, it's interesting. One of the things that, that myself and Joe, my main business partner, we love to do is network. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I'm teaching it to other people, I like to go really all out because I tell people, if you really want to be awesome at this, learn to inspire people, show empathy, really inspire them because you're changing their life and you'll be unforgettable. And but the, the truth of the matter is, is what you're saying is so true, because a lot of times people come back and they keep saying things like, oh, I, you know, I'm trying to adjust my resume or I'm worried about how everybody else perceives me or, you know, I said, folks, please, please stop trying to make everyone happy. That is the job of a bottle of wine. And everybody starts laughing. And I said, it's true. And when you realize that everything will be different because now you realize that. As I say to people, the higher your vibe gets, the smaller your tribe, because you start to realize that there are only certain people that radiate the energy that you're attracted to. The others who you'll talk to and interact with, but it'll be a totally different conversation than being with those people who help you become better. Right. Mm -hmm. It's all about value. Yeah. You know. And another thing I would add, because I'm, I'm like you, I really do enjoy being out and mixing it up with different people because you never know who you're going to meet and you never know what may be possible because of those relationships and you know as much as i believe in being excellent at your work being educated being all of those things when i reflect on who i know who's been most successful it's usually not the smartest person they're no. smart enough but it's somebody who has great relationships. So if I had to choose, would I want to be an A-plus student with a very lackluster personality or have an amazing personality and a so-so GPA? I'll take the personality every single time. Yeah, yeah. 100%. In the past, uh, I know from personal experience, I worked in IT for years. I worked with people that had PhDs or whatever else that couldn't hold down a conversation with a, with a client that couldn't, you know, whatever. And I'm going, yeah. And everybody's turning and saying, hey, James, or whoever that had the ability to really, uh, you know, sort of help that client settle down or whatever it is and say everything's going to be okay. I'm going to get back to you. I'm going to figure this out or whatever. It's that's what really matters. And 
I tell people all the time, and this is the same thing when, when people with interviews, is they look at, oh, what's your education? What's this? What's that? Like, that's only it matters. And then you're like, you know what, folks, you know what really matters is how well are they going to get along with the rest of your team? How, you know, do they have emotional intelligence? Do they have the ability to really interact? Did, are they going to help promote people? Are they going to encourage others? Or are they just going to be all about themselves? And, you know, and that kind of stuff, unfortunately, still happens. And then even when leaders reward, well, I wouldn't say the leaders are bosses. When they reward people like that, that's wrong, period. You know, so I, Helen, you're absolutely right. I'd love to network with you. And I, you have such a calming demeanor anyway. That would be awesome. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully our paths will cross in real life. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm based in Ottawa. Where Whereabouts are you two based? We're in London, Ontario. Okay. Um, but uh, like certainly Joseph and I, the CEO of the company, we've been up in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of business in Ottawa. That's how I got to know Mildred and, okay. and so many others up there. And uh, not being there, but connecting at first. And then I actually met with her when we were there. And, and she, it was just awesome because to see, again, it's, it's that ability to have conversations, ability mm -hmm. to really get along with people. And it makes a huge difference because then they really want to work with you. They, they want to help you. And you continue to want to help them, That's right? It. Yeah. Couldn't agree with you more. Thank you. So there are a lot of employees out there right now that are probably stuck thinking about whether or not it is time for them to move on from the job that they're at. And making that decision can be super difficult. There can be any number of reasons why somebody would be thinking about this, but do you have any advice or could you tell people some advice to help them know when it's time for them to move on from their current job? Like what would be one of those big aha moments that they should watch for? Well, again, there's a whole chapter on this in the book, so I won't spoil everything. But uh, the big one in my mind is, I guess, this, I guess there's two big pieces. Number one if you've kind of been there, done that, and you're not learning anything in your new job, probably means it's time to find the next opportunity where you can continue to grow and develop as a professional. Then the second one is uh, financial. If you seem to have plateaued income-wise and there's no real room to grow, hey, let's face it, especially now with inflation being as high as it is, it's worth reevaluating and seeing what else is out there, uh, doing a bit of homework to find out could you earn more in another role, in another organization. So those are, those are the two big ones. And then, of course, if you're just not being treated well and you just don't feel comfortable there, that's, that's also another good signal that it's time to move along. Yeah, love that. Yeah, that's that's so true. You are impacted by your environment. And a lot of times people, they they get mired in that. And then all of a sudden you're like, no, you need to really step back and say, you know, what's my value? Where do I want to go? What's, you know, where do I want to attain? When am I going to be happy and grow and get outside my comfort zone? Or I'm going to be stuck in a place just because your boss, your colleagues, they may not think the same way. You shouldn't be held back. You should, you know, be wanting to achieve more all the time. So we are coming to the end of our episode today, and we do want to say thank you for having you here with us. But before we kind of end things off, is there anything else that you would like to tell us about or talk to us about today? I can't think of anything, but I've enjoyed speaking with both of you. So I just want to say thank you for, for inviting me on your show. Other than buy your book. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, buy my book. <laughs> Oh, hell of yes, why um, my I finally have a copy handy. I, for the longest while, I never had one on my desk, but now I keep one on my desk. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Helen. This has been really uh, wonderful. Love. We love the way you think. Um, and really encourage you to, to follow what we're doing, because I think we have the same kind of values. Um, and um, we love what you're doing. Have you seen our marketplace, by the way? Not your marketplace, no, just uh, some of the social media. What's okay, on so the marketplace? Yeah, we have a marketplace, and people don't need to be logged in to see it. And the marketplace 
uh, is a, it might be a great place to post your book. I know uh, there's a lovely lady in your community named Nicole Dawes. I don't know if you know her or not. She's a caregiver. No. Beautiful person. Beautiful person. Speaks about emotional intelligence and all that. Her book is in our marketplace. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know Sarah Fung, the rock star nurse on uh, LinkedIn. She's she Her resume writing skills are on it. Okay. So, you know, I think that, you know, you might align with that. And um, yeah. So, well, you know what? I'll send you information about it afterwards. I don't look after it, but I'm going to send stuff in a link so you can see it yourself. Uh, I think you'll you'll like what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish because it's all about adding value um, to people. And, um, yeah, I'll send you some info, okay? All right. Well, thank you. And My hopefully pleasure. before you come back to Ottawa, you'll let me know so that <laughs> you and I and your partner and uh, Mildred, Mildred can all get that together would be great. for lunch or yeah. coffee or something. Yeah, Mildred and I and Nicole, by the way, uh, hung out at the market in Ottawa. Okay. And I'd never been there before. It was beautiful. Loved it. It was a cool spot. Yeah. Thank you so much again, Helen. And we are very thankful we got to have you on the podcast today. And hopefully we will be hearing more from you in the future. Thank you. I hope you do. And I hope we get to reconnect at some point. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. And Thanks, you as Helen. well.